gates in the city is closed south by the London Wall for emergency repairs to an end. London can seem an assault on the senses for the million and more commuters who cross the city through the clogged arteries of its tube or upon its traffic angry bridges. And with 10 million of us set to rub shoulders in the capital by 2030, Londoners are feeling the strain. But what if you could tune out the fog of grey and noise and traffic congested, rain spattered London, and walk amongst plants and trees and flowers in your own enchanted garden right there on the Thames? soft rustle of leaves and a weird feeling of being bang in the heart of one of the greatest, brightest, most blazing cities in the world. But you're walking through a kind of wilderness of green and nature and Maybe now, maybe now there's a moment to make something that we believe could be amazing for London to happen. Her accomplice is someone you may not know by name, but you do know him. He designed the 2012 Olympic Cauldron. He secured best in show for Britain at the World Expo when he represented us with a giant hairy cube. Recently, he has refashioned London's much-loved Big Red Bus. That's him, Thomas Heatherwick, the magician in his den. That's the band Terence Conrad declared the Leonardo da Vinci of our times, and it's stuck. They call him Britain's most creative mind. He makes the improbable possible. He's up there with Willy Wonka and the Wizard of Oz. From his studio in North London, Thomas and his team are hatching ideas for everything from unlikely looking chairs to whole districts in Asia. Schemes are growing ever more audacious. And now, a daring proposal to make a permanent mark on the capital. It seems there really is no stopping him. Twenty years ago, Heatherwick's studio was a bedsit in Camden. His practice is now a 110-strong team of architects, industrial designers and model makers in one creative cross-pollination. I mean, we all know why that one's the best one. Oh, uh, yeah. You don't need to convince me. <laughs> they tackle monster projects overseas. A university campus in Malaysia. A half-kilometre-wide shopping city and housing development in Shanghai. He's gaining a reputation as a maverick who makes bold ideas happen, with a steely belief in his inventions, no matter how improbable. So, when an actress turns to him with a whimsical idea for a hundred million pound bridge in central London, he's the man. Thank you. So you have this idea of what for, for a garden bridge, a bridge that is a garden? A bridge that is a garden. A bridge that flies out across the Thames for people to walk, to meander, not to race across London, not to, not to hurry across the bridge, usually collars turned up, straight, 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 you can see from one side to the other. This bridge, as soon as you get onto it, you can't see across it. It's covered with trees and plants and winding paths. You dawdle across it, coffee, you're a clairvoyant, thank you. You lean on the edge and stare out down at the river, you play poo sticks, you blow wishes, you make kisses, you drop to one knee and propose to your girlfriend. So it had to have a kind of durable, eternal feeling about it. In a way, I felt it's like a ghost waiting to be discovered, like a, 
something we've uncovered the whole notion it's of such a, it's such a romantic notion this notion of yours it's a, it's sort of it's almost sort of fantastical some some might say it's it's indulgent but, but yes, it's indulging London. <laughs> London wanted this little adornment. It's you, had you, enough of hard work, wanted a little <laughs> bit of a tiara for the moment. <laughs> if London deserves this adornment of a garden on a bridge, what kind of Darwinian forces need to be in play to make this idea prosper where others may fail? To take it from a what-if to an actual river crossing? The clues are in Thomas's creative incubator. It's filled with mementos of inventions past, inventions on the go, and a healthy measure of just maybes. I first met Thomas when he was a relative newcomer to the design world, but already in the business of making eyes widen and jaws drop. If there was a Heatherwick style emerging, it was an interrogation of materials and how far you could push their possibilities. Why can't a bridge curl up into a ball like a recoiling caterpillar? Or why can't a design for a building come from the folds of a cloth? Have a, have a seat. You, 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 won't, you won't fall out. Won't I? You, no. Does that make sense? But you can, if you want to, you can go all the way oh around. Oh my God, you must be joking. <laughs> that's it. Oh my God. That's it, that's it. And then stick your... That's it. When we designed it, we were trying to make a comfortable chair and just seeing, could you have a shape where the bit you sat on was, was comfortable as a back? Could, could the same bit do, but be your arm? We were designing a serious thing to sit on. Well but it ended up that we were making a thing that had this funny <laughs> other function. Which, you look so relaxed. But it surprised us. It wasn't yeah. what we'd expected. We, let's do the show right here. That's what they say. Right. <laughs> There's a playfulness about everything you do. And of course, play, out of play comes ideas. That notion when we first met, scrunching up a piece of paper and then seriously developing the idea that could that scrunching of that piece of paper turn into a building? What's in your, in your head? I, I find it funny when people say, you know, you're, that, oh, you're, you're trying to be, make things that are humorous or, or um, be a magician in that I see it as what design is, is trying to push what things, what things are made from, how they function, how you can use resources that are available to, to try to do things that might matter more. I've always been interested in publicness and I've no, no interest in people's private homes or individual, it's the bit that we all share that's just as much the rubbish dump as it is the bit that gets called the art gallery. I see everything as things that could be better. So, for example, power stations. Yes. Rarely do people think, how do I make a power station beautiful? I've just found it very obvious if you were going to build a two-storey house, the planning authority would be going, what brick are you going to use? How does that go with the local vernacular? But if you're doing a 20-storey biomass power station, all you need to do, I was told this, a pencil box 85 metres high and just say, biomass power station, planning permission? Someone go, sure, biomass, did you say biomass? We found the same with buses. There are 7,000 two-storey buildings on wheels going around London. And for many decades now, the only, the only control has been, is it red? London has strong feelings about its bus. When the Routemaster came into service in the 1950s, it became a visual shorthand for London itself. But the beast of a bus was an inaccessible, air-choking machine and couldn't keep up with the city's demands. Now is the time for us to produce a worthy successor. It was Thomas Heatherwick who Boris turned to when he wanted to rethink this much-cherished piece of London architecture. Heatherwick's new, greener, diesel-electric hybrid has recently arrived on the streets. 
Built from lightweight material, the new model has an extra staircase and three doors, and it hails a return of the Root Master's hop-on, hop-off open platform. What was wrong with the, the London bus when you came to look at it? The bus environments we've got used to have been incremental. So there's been initiative, and then another initiative, and another initiative, and they've layered up like kind of barnacles on top of each other. Yes. For example, saying, we must have a particular lumen level, amount of light falling. And suddenly, th there are fluorescent tubes throughout a bus. Now, it doesn't sound bad, but that's the same fluorescent tubes that are in a chicken, battery chicken farm. It's the least <laughs> flattering to human skin. It, I mean, everything, even the hand poles. You could tell someone and said, contrast level, is that the new regulation? OK, you want contrast level? I'll give you contrast level. And they've gone, nuclear warning yellow. There was also something with seats, where the seats became separate objects. Even though your seat and my seat will never move from each other, they would have each have a separate handle, and that then meant that when you looked along the bus, you were just looking at all these handles all the way into the distance. Hang on. If those are never going to move and we need a handle, why can't it just be one handle? And that halves the number of clutter, clutter objects catching your eyeball. Yeah. So in a way, it felt like we were just trying to untangle that and say, well, well, let's meet all those needs and just focus on what might be best for a passenger and allow them to be calm. And instead of a cacophony of these things, enjoy the cacophony of London, because that's the thing that's the pleasure to sit and look out at. The new bus is not one of Thomas's more wizard-like, wow designs, and it's not without its critics, but it's found its way into the hearts of most Londoners. We relish the freedom it restores to get on it and off it where we please. You're allowed to just hop off. Brilliant. That's the rules, <laughs> the, the rules. <laughs> You sense in many Heatherwick designs that their forms spring from something earthy and organic and evolve not through any academic approach to architecture, but more from some inspired messing about in the workshop. His talent is phenomenal. And what I love about him is that, is that he's endorsed by nature. Everything you see of his has come from the grace of the natural world. He has starbursts, like huge umbilical sort of flowers. He has leaf shapes and shell shapes and tree shapes. He loves nature, so none of his work is brutalist. I believe he has come straight from the woods. I think he might be the green man. Only, I'm only half joking here. He's got an extraordinary affinity. Heatherwick's affinity with nature and his boundless ambition came together quite spectacularly recently when he won the job of representing Britain in the World Expo in Shanghai. There were, at the same moment on the planet, 250 countries were each giving a brief to a design team to do a pavilion that would show the history, show the tourism, show the economic success, show the sporting prowess. And the British government had put this quirk in the brief and they'd said, when there's voting, make sure you're in the top five out of 250 pavilions. So how do you be in the top five? And it seemed, don't try and say everything. Don't say all cliches. Even though Sherlock Holmes is amazing, don't show Sherlock Holmes. Don't show the things that are international stereotypes. This idea emerged, what if we had just a quarter of a million seeds. A seed cathedral and people are looking like, is that going to be like potpourri or is that going to be like nuts? We made 66,000 windows, but each window was uh, seven and a half metres long and one of those seeds might be the reason that your grandmother lived for another 15 years from a medicine that was developed from it. And another seed might be the reason, just this tiny, puny, insignificant thing could be the reason the economy of one country succeeds or fails in a given year because of a crop. And in the end, it was voted the number one pavilion at the expo. 
And it felt exciting to use what Britain is very good at, is ideas. 